All right, so in this next section, we're going to go over the basics of 3D code, um, at least in terms of what I use it for, and that's mainly um, sculpting tools for concept art. So 3D code's a pretty big program. It actually does really good job, apparently, at uh, retopology. Re uh, it, it just introduced a poly modeling. It does texture painting. It kind of does a lot. But mainly, I just use it for voxel sculpting. And I think that's kind of its strength compared to ZBrush. Um, so ZBrush, you know, that's the more po popular program by far. And um, it, it is really, you know, it's industry standard for sculpting. And it, it can uh, do really, really amazing, highly detailed stuff. Um, but I think 3D code is a little bit simpler. It's easier to learn. And it's easier to use, at least for, uh, for, for concept art, I think. So that's kind of why I got into it. And now I just, I just know it you know, more than I know ZBrush. So that's why I use it. Um, but then also the, the voxel sculpting option is kind of unique to this program, as I understand it. And we'll talk about what makes it useful and unique uh, in a second. So this is the menu that you should get when you open up the new 2021 version. And um, I'm going to ignore all of this and just go ahead and click voxel sculpting. Um, and that brings up this menu, which is uh, the options of uh, what you want to might want to start with in the voxel room. So if you just click the grid, um, it'll just give you an empty canvas. Um, and then these are the primitives and even some human bases that you can start with if you want. I'm actually going to go ahead and click the cube for now. Um, and it'll, it'll get us started uh, with, with some options. So this menu that pops up next um, is just kind of a lot of information. Um, I'm going to actually just click OK. It's just telling you how things work. Um, and we'll uh, go right ahead into some of the UI and how to navigate the program. So if you right click and drag, that'll zoom in and out. If you click left click and drag, it'll rotate. And middle mouse button is pan around. So those are the basic navigation tools there. And um, if you are rotating around and you hold shift, it'll snap you to uh, the orthographic view that you're closest to. So if I'm hovering near the top view and then I hold shift while I'm, while I'm holding the left mouse button, it'll snap me to the top view. If I'm, you know, near the, the right view, it'll snap me to the right view. And actually, we're in perspective view right now, so that's not as apparent. So if you hover up here, it'll actually show you a ton of uh, viewport options. And we're going to ignore most of those for now and just click this cube for now. And what that is is orthographic view, uh, which is basically removing all perspective, right? So uh, if you're clicking and rotating around now, it's a little bit more obvious that we're in uh, the orthographic view when you hold shift. OK, so uh, let's go over some of the UI just to explain everything that's in here. Um, the sculpt tree, first of all, that's the layers in uh, your current scene. It's probably the most important thing on this whole side over here. Um, layers is actually not your sculpting layers. Layers means the, uh, the painting and texture stuff, which again, we're not really going to talk too much about. So it's all about the sculpt tree. The, these are the actual layers in your scene um, in terms of the, the sculpting anyway. Uh, over here, you have the sculpting tools themselves. And they might not actually look like this when you open up your program. I've set it, them to look like this. If you, if you click this button right here, it's like text versus picture. It actually rotates if you keep clicking through like a, a few different options for viewing. Um, and you can kind of choose the one that you prefer. Basically, it's you know the size of the picture of what the tool does versus the text explaining what it actually is. Um, my favorite is actually that last one we were just on, just because it's a tiny bit of information and, and you could kind of get the best, best of both worlds. And then, of course, if you uh, scroll wheel down, this, this menu is quite large. Most of this we're not going to even need or, or talk too much about. And um, you can mess around with all of them as we go. Uh, once once we have a basic understanding of how things work. But uh, for now, we're, we're just going to pick out a few and, and talk about them. Uh, but first, we've got to explain a little bit more about how um, how this program works. So first things first, let's actually get a real cube to sculpt on. 
So actually this orange means that this is just a preview of what the cube uh, would look like if we place it. And uh, the way you place it would be to hit the enter key. So I just did that and nothing changed. And that's because there's still a preview right here. So if I move that out of the way using this you know, gizmo uh, right here, there's actually a gray cube that we just placed. And now there's a, another uh, possible preview. So we can actually hit enter again, place another gray cube. And these are the actual voxel um, primitives that you can sculpt on. And then uh, this is just the preview if you want to continue placing them. You can actually scale this up if you, if you want to do that and make it perfect before you actually hit enter. Um, so that's totally up to you and, and the scene that you're trying to make. Okay, so if I actually just click any other tool over here, it'll get rid of that preview and we're left with the placed uh, primitives. So um, that's that's kind of the first thing and and you, you know, I, I recommend just starting out with like a cube if you're just messing around with some of the tools just because uh, it'll it'll be easy to, to understand how to work with, with it. Um, so first thing about 3D coat that you need to know is the way uh, the way voxels work um, and the way the way they're different than uh, the surface option. So the surface option in 3D coat is the is similar to ZBrush and and a lot of other programs where there's like a shell of quads and triangles around the outside of an object and then inside is just empty. That's kind of how traditional 3D programs work. Voxels are more like 3D pixels. So um, as I understand it anyways, and we're not gonna get too technical, but basically this, a voxel object in 3D code is made up of like a ton of little, um, like little cubes or little triangles inside here. So if we were to like cut away from, from this, there would actually be stuff inside there if we were to like somehow see X-ray vision through it. Uh, versus a traditional 3D program, it would, it would just be a shell, if that makes sense. So basically, the, the reason that's useful is because um, it, it acts a little bit more like regular clay than a traditional sculpting program like, like ZBrush would. And that kind of allows you to get some really crazy um, shapes. And, and the way it even like smudges and breaks is more like clay. Um, for ex and uh, it is pixelating a little, and we'll talk about how to deal with that. But I think ultimately there's a, like, a little bit more freedom with, um, with voxels in, in the kind of crazy shapes you can make versus uh, tr traditional you know, triangles and quads. So that's kind of the strength of it. I'm just gonna control Z some of that back. And um, you know, 3D Coat, it actually does have uh, a lot of that traditional stuff. Even in fact, if I just click this V right here on this on this layer, um, it'll actually switch the object I'm selected on um, over to surface mode, and you can see that switch to an S here. And this is just information on how the, the uh, UVs will work. I'll just hit yes, and now it's switched over to a surface, and that's more like a, a traditional program. And um, often you'll you might want to do that if switch over to surface if you're trying to get really high detail on the object. Um, but we're probably just going to stick with voxels in this whole tutorial just because, I mean, that's that's what I know more. And if you click this S, uh, it'll actually switch you back to voxels. Um, and see there, it's, it's switched over to a V. Um, and and uh, yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of how that works. Um, the first thing about voxels is the resolution of them. So um, when we were messing around with this, um, we actually got some of the pixelation, right? And that has to do, if you scroll all the way down to the, these tools, there's a really important tool at the bottom here called resample. And if you click that, it um, kind of shows you the, the pixel density, basically, the, the resolution of the 3D object. So 890,000, that's, that's a pretty decent resolution that we have right now. If you if you hover below it and drag down, it lets you go down to a certain uh, certain number. I'm going to click OK. And you immediately see it's getting a little bit less resolution there. And if I, if I go back to resample and, and lower it even more, it only lets you go down a certain amount at a time or up a certain amount of time. So I have to do it again. And that'll give us like a really low density, low uh, resolution 3D object, basically. 
So you kind of have to always watch out when you're sculpting in, in 3D code with, with voxels, what your resolution is. Um, but the good thing is you can constantly just up it if you need more or lower it if, if, if you want less. And uh, the reason you might want less in some cases is because it is lighter on the program and it'll run faster. Um, so you'll, you'll constantly be switching, switching this uh, resample. And um, yeah, that's, that's really important to know. So let's talk a little bit more about how, you, how uh, the interface works. Um, one really amazing thing about 3D code, and I don't understand why other programs don't do this or, or haven't learned from this, but if you actually hover over anything in the program, so let's hover over this tool, that, this resample tool that we were just using. And if you hold the end key on the numpad, you see we get this option down here that popped up call and it says press key combination to define new hotkey. What that means is the very next key that I select after the end key will set that uh, tool to that new hotkey. So if I just hit R, it reset that tool to the hotkey R for me. And now if I hit R, it'll bring up that menu that we saw before when we just clicked it, right? So we reset the hotkey. And I think that there's you know other programs that have ways to reset hotkeys for you, but I've never seen anything quite so customizable as 3D code. Just being able to hover over anything in the program, you know, hold the end key on your numpad and then reset it to whatever hotkey you want. It's it's really an amazing, uh, useful part of 3D code. So I definitely recommend using it. And that applies also to even all these window things up here. So it's not just the tools, it's, it's even like all these options, everything in the whole program. So you'll see if I click on geometry, it, it's, I've set these menu options to these hotkeys um, just by hovering over them, holding end, and then doing the, the combination after that. So yeah, I recommend right away setting, setting resample to R just because that's going to be the most the super frequent thing that you're going to use. Uh, one thing you'll notice right away in 3D code is this gizmo here to move uh, your primitives around um, is only there in the preview by default. And then as soon as you actually hit enter to place the cube uh, and then switch over to another tool, that gizmo disappears. And it's a little bit counterintuitive, but you actually need to go over here uh, in the middle of these tools and click the transform tool to get it back. And now you can move uh, these voxel objects around. Um, I don't think that hotkey is set by default. I've set it to control T and I recommend doing something like that as well. And, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll be using that very often to move things around. Um, one thing they added in 2021 version of 3D code, which I think was a great addition is that you, uh, there's a, a faster version of moving things around now. If you just uh, hit the G letter, that'll move, that'll, if you hit the G and then move your mouse without clicking anything, um, it moves the object for you without you having to actually go in and click the little gizmo and, and find the arrow and the axis that you want. Um, but it is sort of confusing because it, it doesn't follow um, the field of view that you're in. So you it, very often you'll probably want to do that in orthographic view and then hit G and move things around. And then you, you click to accept the move. It's very similar to Blender actually, that, that uh, G function. I don't know if you are a Blender user. Hopefully you know a little bit because we're going to get into it in the next section. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice quick addition to move things around as well. And you don't have to be on the transform to use that, I think. Actually, let's test that. So if we go to the grow, the grow tool, we're, we're sculpting, and then uh, we hit the G. Yeah, it still still moves around. Uh, one more navigational quirk of uh, moving things around in 3D code is that uh, not all the options on this uh, widget um, will will always show up every time. So right now I am on uh, transform, by the way, which I've set to Control T. And uh, you'll notice if just like other 3D programs, if you hit Q, W, E, um, you'll get some slightly different rotation and move options. Um, and you can kind of isolate the one that you want. 
but mainly I just hit Q if some of the other ones are not showing. And that actually shows everything that you're able to do, right? So here's the scale option, here's the move option, the rotate option. Um, so that's that's pretty much the one I always work with. I just like having every option available. Uh, so, you know, if, if something's not there and you're not sure why, just go ahead and hit Q and uh, you'll get all those options. Uh, one thing about um, navigating in 3D code is that very often um, while you're sculpting and then trying to rotate, your object itself will kind of be in the way. So left click and drag is rotate, but let's say you're sculpting on here and then you accidentally click on it while you're trying to rotate. That can be very annoying. So all you have to do is hold the Alt key and then um, it'll, it'll hide the sculpting tool and allow you to uh, click and drag to rotate again, even if you're selected on your object. Um, so yeah, uh, one more. And then uh, one other thing is that if you uh, lose your object, like let's say you're rotating around somewhere else and you can't find what you're selected on, um, you just uh, hit Shift A and it'll center you back onto the object you're currently selected. Okay, so one quirk of 3D code that you need to be aware of is the uh, resolution of objects changes based on the scale of um, the preview when you're placing it. Okay, so um, just to illustrate that real quick, we have this preview cube right here. It's quite small in proportion to the grid. And uh, if I hit enter and um, go ahead and hit R, we can check the resolution of that cube. It's only 5,000, which is very small for 3D code. But if I you know, place another cube, scale it way up, move it over here, hit enter, and uh, we hit R to check the resolution of that object, it's 210,000, which is quite a, quite a big difference. And that only changes when we are placing them. So um, if I were to you know, select out this cube, put it in a new mesh, and uh, let's check, double check, yeah, so it's still 5,000. If I were to scale that up, and now check the resolution, it's still 5,000, okay? And that's because uh, the resolution change is only comes into effect when you're actually in preview mode, okay? It's a little tricky, but uh, it, uh, you know, you can still resample this up if you want, if you want to make changes now. And also notice the uh, bevel is much more pronounced because it was so low resolution, okay? The bevel here is very sharp because it was high resolution. So those are kind of quirks of 3D code you need to be aware of. Uh, another thing is that stretching is a little bit confusing in 3D code. So um, if I were to um, st stretch this this way, and uh, if you hit W, you can actually see the wireframe of the object. And you can see as I, st as I stretch it, uh, you can see the outer voxels actually stretching. Um, and uh, that sometimes gives you really gross and jagged edges because the, the, vo the voxels don't have enough information. They, they get stretched out and don't work as well. So what you need to do in a lot of cases like this is right click the object and uh, you get, whoops, hover over the menu. And uh, there's this transform to global space option. And I've set that to control G. And um, let's see what happens if I do it. If I hit Control G, it rescales all the voxels back to square and or, you know square and triangles, uh, and that that'll give us much better edges basically when we start making cuts. So you need to be careful when you're scaling this way and and you know any direction with with the scale option. Um, yeah, I would I would just always hit Control G to to uh, re recalculate and and stop that stretching from happening. Sometimes that can crash though if your mesh is really, really high res. So watch out. Don't don't transform to global space unless uh, unless you really think it's necessary. So right away I want to make you aware of something that uh, can be sort of annoying if you don't know what's going on with uh, making uh, changes in 3D code when there's multiple objects in a scene. So uh, here's an example of that. I have two you know, sculpt layers. One has both of these boxes in it, and one has just this box. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and just show you this with the pose tool. And uh, if I, you know, I'm on the rectangular, if I make a, if I'm selected on this object, okay, with the two boxes, and I go ahead and make a selection, 
it should only select uh, the box that's part of the layer that I'm on. Okay, that's the way I want it to work. Um, you know, most of the time, I think that's how you would want it to work when you're when you're sculpting. Uh, but sometimes um, it happens where this checkbox up here, um, through all, is checked on. I think it might even be by default on some tools. And what that would do, just to show you what what's happening here, is if I make a selection, it's going to select both the objects, all all the visible objects that are in the scene. Uh, and that can be very annoying because then you're you know, all of a sudden making changes to objects that you didn't want to change. So definitely almost all the time want that checked off. Um, and, you know, just keep that in mind if that's, if that's happening to you, that's probably what's going on. Another uh, kind of annoying little checkbox that you really need to be aware of is um, this auto check up here. Um, and I, th I believe it might be, it used to be called auto pick. Um, in the previous version of 3D Coat. But just to show you what that is and, and kind of uh, what you want to avoid with it. So I have, again, these two layers right here. In this layer, I have just that one cube. In this layer, I have both these cubes. Uh, and let's just go ahead and show you this on the Pose tool. So if I make a selection with the Pose tool, you see that little flash there um, when, I, when I crossed over onto uh, this bottom layer? Um, See if we can get it to show you that again. If I select something else, let's say I select this box, it's flashing, uh, telling me which object is currently uh, active, which one I'm going to be making a change to. Okay, so if I'm selected on the bottom ones, and then I hit the pose tool, and if auto is checked on, that means it'll actually change the, um, it'll change which object is active if you just accidentally cross over it before you get to the other one. See that? So now it's making a selection to this object instead of the one I wanted. Um, so that could be very confusing and kind of annoying if you have, you know, 100 objects in the scene. So almost all the time, I, if I'm on a, uh, you know, any tool, I just check that off, you know, um, and then if I want to change to a different object, I can go over here and click it in the, myself, in the layer tree. Uh, or probably the fastest way is you hover over it and hit the letter H. Um, and that, that'll switch you to that object uh, as the active object. And then you can go ahead and, and make your selection or change. Um, so keep that in mind. It took me forever to find that little auto checkbox. Um, so I just want you to be aware of it. Uh, so I want to talk about how Boolean operations work in 3D code. It's a little bit different, kind of odd compared to other programs. Uh, Boolean is just using a shape to cut into another shape. Um, so let's move this cube to overlap with the sphere. And um, I'll select uh, the, the sphere. Uh, I could go in here and click the other layer, but what I like to do is just hover over the object that I want to select and hit the letter H, and it'll uh, select that object. And if I click and drag on the layer and hover it over the other layer, We'll see those two little circles actually just to the right of my cursor there and that's showing that it's going to be a boolean operation uh, and if i let go oops if i let go uh, it will make the cut so you'll see there it will uh, cut using the shape uh, that we that we made with the sphere um, so again that's just clicking and uh, dragging while holding control uh, onto the other layer and of course you can go you know, both directions, just click and drag the other way. Um, so yeah, quite useful if you want to make, you know, arches You can use like a, a cylinder to cut out of the a cube or, or just any, there's many, many uses for Booleans if you're familiar with 3D. Um, but uh, yeah, that's how you do it here. Okay, so let's go over how symmetry works in 3D Coat. You'll be using this quite a bit. Uh, the hotkey in 3D Coat for that is just the letter S on the keyboard that's automatically set to that. And it brings up the symmetry menu, and there's quite a few here. The main one, though, is just this enable symmetry that you then check on. And then here in the symmetry type um, are the different axes that the symmetry will be arrayed across. So let's check on enable symmetry and check on the x-axis for a second. And now if we go through that process of placing a cube with my spacebar and primitives quick pick, we'll see that uh, there's now two, uh, two previews across the x-axis. And that's because we enabled 
the x-axis symmetry, right? Um, and if we were to hit S again and check on Y as well, and then move this up, you'll see that it's it's uh, arrayed on the x-axis and on the y-axis. Um, and if I hit enter, it would actually place all, all of those, okay? And you can see there, it's showing you the symmetry planes and where they're placed. And that's actually really useful as well when you uh, want to move that plane around, you can um, use the symmetry in different areas, okay? So that's placing uh, an object uh, using symmetry. But if you already if you already have an object, so let's go into let's turn off symmetry for a second. Cut off. Um, oh, I'm on this version of it. So cut off all of these. I'm going to hit Shift A to center on the. Oh, it's still uh, it's still centered to all of them, but that's okay. We're going to look at this for a second. So if I were to hit S now, and enable symmetry, you'll see that the. Um, oh, let's not talk that there. So you'll see that the symmetry planes are they're, um, in the same place as they were when we created these cubes, OK? And we might not want that. We might want them uh, to be centered on this object. And very often, you will want that. So in this symmetry menu, if you uh, click this pick from bound, I think it's actually pick from bound box. Yeah. If you click that, it does center it to the, the voxels that are left in this object, OK? Reset symmetry will bring them back to the center of the, um, of the scene. And then pick from bound box will bring them back to, uh, to the object itself. And sometimes that checks on and off. Reset checks off all of the axes. You have to check those back on every time you do that. OK, so if we click X, we click bound, uh, pick from bound box. We're now centered on this object. And now, if uh, if we were to you know pick, let's just say any of these, the carve tool, for example, and we're to sculpt on here, uh, we would get symmetry on this object across the x-axis. Okay. If we were to select the y-axis as well, it would do both. Let's just see what that looks like. Very very useful. And then of course the z-axis works the same way. Um, and then there's a few other really useful options in here as well. This XYZ mirror is kind of the type of symmetry that we have. And that has that works with these different axes. That's sort of the most simple form of symmetry. There's um, another couple of useful ones in here, though. Radial, uh, radial symmetry and radial mirror. I, I've used it a couple times. Um, mainly that's for, um, for cylinders, though. Let's take a quick look at how that works. I'm going to clear this. Turn off symmetry just to place space bar, place a cylinder, select a cylinder, shift A to center. Let's uh, actually scale this up a little bit before we place and enter. OK, so on a cylinder, if we were to hit S, enable symmetry, switch this over to radial symmetry, you'll see that there's uh, an um, on this menu, that is not here, but on this menu, there's a radial order number. And what four means is um, if I were to do the carve sculpting on here now. Okay, so the, the symmetry plane is all the way over here, and it's doing a radial symmetry centered on that. But we actually want to pick from bound box in this case. So let's uh, delete that. Uh, S for symmetry radial symmetry, pick from bound box. Okay, now if I were to do the carve tool, actually it's not, it's not showing up for some reason. Did we pick from bound box? Hold on. Oh, it's not checked on. See, it, it check on, then pick from bound box. Okay, there we go. Now it's going to uh, be arrayed in four different areas around the center there. Okay. So yeah, you got to be careful. Sometimes this enable checks off whenever you click these options down here. It's a little uh, confusing, but yeah, you just got to make sure it's actually on. And there's the visual representation of that. And then uh, we can reset the, you know, set this to different numbers. If you want eight of them, there'll be eight of these little um, segments that we're sculpting with. And uh, I wouldn't go too high. It depends on you know how complicated what you're making is. But you know if you go all the way up to like 20, it'll probably it'll probably slow down quite a bit. 
depending on how uh, high resolution. But you can get really cool stuff with this and it's very, very useful for architecture as well. Um, and we'll, we'll get into how that works practically, but um, yeah, I would definitely just get used to hitting S and then working with this menu and, and definitely remember reset symmetry goes back to the scene and pick from bound box um, stays within uh, the, the mesh that you have. All right, let's go over how duplicating and instancing objects works in 3D code. Um, they're a little bit different, similar to other 3D programs. A regular duplication is going to be a little bit heavier um, on your scene, and instancing is a little bit lighter. So uh, let's talk about um, how both of them work. So a regular duplication uh, is actually this button right here. Let's duplicate, and I've set it to Control D. So let's uh, test that out. So I'm going to go to the Transform tool. I'm going to hit Control D, and then move it over here. And uh, we'll see that we just got a straight up duplication of that cube. Um, instancing is um, somewhere, I believe it's, yeah, it's underneath this transform tool and you click the instancer and it brings up this instance menu. I've set the instancer itself to uh, the letter I. And um, once you're in this menu, you can click this new instance button. You can also set a hotkey for that. Um, and it actually created an instance inside uh, the group of the first object. So it's parented to it. So if we select the second one, move it over here, um, this um, is not only duplicated, but they're also linked objects, right? So if we were to click on the first object and make some kind of a cut, it'll actually update that on the other object. We, and um, I believe vice versa as well. If we select the second one, make a cut, it'll update the, the first one. And then in addition to them being linked like that, um, they're also, it's just lighter on the scene. So if you have a really complicated object, you should probably use the instancer rather than uh, the regular duplication. Um, you can uninstance objects. So if you want wanted all of a sudden for one of these to be different than the other and then not to be linked like that, you would click this uninstance all button. That's everything in the scene. You can also just uh, use uninstance current to select uh, one of the objects in the scene. Um, and Let's, let's do that uh, right now to illustrate actually. So uninstance all, then we'll scale this up, make it uh, make another cut and we'll see it's not updating with the other one. Okay, let's go over how parenting and uh, groups work in 3D code. Very important and uh, useful also for um, making big groups of, of different objects. So uh, let's take a look. So right now we just have one object in the scene that's parented to the root again, which is everything in the scene. So that root always kind of has to stay here. Um, if I go ahead and click this to make a new layer, um, we just have two different layers. Um, and in 3D code, layers are basically the same thing as groups. So I could click and drag this layer and um, you know wait until we see that arrow there and then let go and it's grouped together with that first layer, okay? Right now, there's nothing on uh, this the second one. So let's place a cube there just so that we see this effect a little bit more. So uh, move it over here. OK, so that's the second one. That's the first one. And you'll notice when I hide the, the, the uh, first layer here, the one that's parented to, uh, it also hides everything that's inside there. Um, and also, if we were to move this top one around, it'll also move everything that's parented to it. Uh, but not, you know, not the other way around. If we move this one, it won't move that first one. Okay. Um, so there's a much faster way to parent things that I suggest you do because very often when there's, you know, a lot of layers, by the way, you can click this button here as well to make a new layer in the root. Um, so yeah, very often when you have a lot of layers, it's kind of a pain to like click and drag, you know, parent to that, click and drag, parent to that because very often you can also kind of misclick and accidentally parent to a parent. So now um, if, you, if you click this minus sign, it'll collapse everything that's in that group. And then if you click this minus sign, it'll collapse everything that's in that group. So now we kind of um, have a lot going on and it's getting complicated. So um, the, the fast way to do this, and let's uh, delete some of this, is of course, once again, to set a uh, custom hotkey, which comes up a lot in 3D code. I'm going to actually just make another cube to illustrate this. 
Okay, so we have two separate layers. Neither of them are parented to each other. And um, if you right click the second one, you get and scroll down on this uh, menu that comes up. All the way at the bottom here is this change parent. And um, that I've set to a hotkey. I've just chosen shift H. So um, what that does is if I hover over the object I want to move in the layer stack and hit shift H, it says there change parent volume 35 and it's flashing. And that means that the very next thing I click, it will parent it to for you, okay? So we see that happen right here. It's now within that, that group when I collapse it. So um, yeah, very often you'll wanna have, you'll have like four or five different objects and you just wanna par parent to them all to the same object. And I just use that shift H change parent method and it's much, much faster. Um, another word on groups, um, they also are, uh, they work uh, with symmetry in a sort of odd way. So we should talk about that. So let's say I have these objects over here and I want to reflect them across the middle of the scene. It's kind of a little bit harder than it, it probably should be in 3D code. So let's, let's see what we can do. So um, we, the, the best way to do it would be to select the top object, okay? And I'm gonna go into my instancer and um, we see these options here and you see this very important one, new mirrored instance. But before we do that, we actually have to turn on symmetry. So I'm gonna hit S, symmetry is now enabled. I'm gonna click this X button and you see right there that the uh, symmetry plane appeared there in the middle. Um, that is, that is, that is centered on the X axis in the scene. Um, if, if you had already centered it to your bounding box though, you might have to mess with that. So remember this one centers it to this object. You might need to reset symmetry to center it back to the center of the scene, then click on this X again to bring it back to the middle of, of the scene. Okay. So now that the symmetry is enabled and the, the symmetry plane is in the right place, if you click this new mirrored instanced uh, button, which you can also set a hotkey for, which I recommend, uh, we see we got a reflection across uh, the way we want. And then also, importantly, it, um, it reflected the group um, the correct way. So we have not only a group on this side, but another group on this side, uh, and they're parented to, to each other. Um, I believe you can also do this with, um, with duplication, but I think the, the way the groups work uh, is better with, with the instancer. So keep that in mind if you're trying to reflect something across a plane. By the way, if we had not selected this top one, if we had just selected this bottom one and reflected it across, it would not have um, grabbed the whole group, right? It, it only grabbed the whole group because we selected the, the top of the group. Okay, so let's go over some of the most useful tools and um, areas of 3D code for sculpting. So first we need something to sculpt on. I actually deleted the cube from before. So I'm going to hit spacebar and that's going to open up all, oops, all of my um, quick picks and uh, you can drag things that you use a lot into these top 10 up here. So on here, I've already selected primitives from uh, one of these options. I put it here at number one. I'm just going to select that. It gives me all these primitive options. Um, that I can load into and start with. I'm just going to use the cube for now. Um, if you if you select over here, it'll it'll switch over to these different types of uh, of primitives. So we'll scale it up a bit. Hit Enter to place it. Uh, we'll switch over to any other tool just to get rid of the preview. And there we have a cube. Um, I'm going to hit R to check the poly count. Thirty three thousand is pretty low. I'm just going to up it a little bit. Let's let's just do a hundred thousand for now. It's still kind of low. Um, but look, I just want to show some of the tools. So Grow is probably the most basic sculpting tool. Um, if you um, just go ahead and click on here, you'll see uh, as you as you sculpt, it'll sort of add, um, it'll, it'll grow out of what's already there. Um, build is a little bit more um, harsh, I think. So if you, but you can kind of see that here in the icon over here. Um, the uh, the layers are, are sort of added on versus like grown from what's already there. 
And that definitely depends on what uh, brush you're using as well. So these are the tools, right? And these are the brushes. So over here, I'm currently selected on a very soft brush and that, that gives us a very, um, you know, gentle, gentle edge. But if I were to select something like this, you can kind of see in that uh, red wave there in the center that the edges are gonna be a bit harsher and a bit more um, angular. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that red wave. So uh, brackets are going to scale up and down your brush. That's the brackets on the keyboard there. Right clicking and dragging up and down is the, um, the strength of the tool. So that's that red wave in the middle. If I were to up it really high, the strength is gonna be really strong and all of a sudden it, it grows really, really um, harshly. And if I lower it down, right click and drag down, it's gonna be just a tiny little bit of a change. So uh, that's grow and build. Smooth is probably um, very useful as well. It generally works on lower poly objects because it's kind of like hard to calculate, but it does just what you would expect it to. It smooths out changes. Um, and uh, you know, if, if we were to lower this again, resample it way, way down, it'll, it'll work really fast and, and strongly because there's not that much, there's not that many polygons to, uh, to smooth, so it, it generally works better with, with lower poly. Uh, Carve, I think I use quite a bit too. It's kind of the even stronger, harsher version of build, sort of um, adds on pieces really uh, strongly, sort of, uh, it, it kind of like adds strips there. I think we need more resolution. So it's like strips that are building on top of each other. Um, and then uh, one thing I didn't mention, I think if on all of these tools, if you hold control, while you're sculpting, it'll do the opposite function, right? So regular, I'm on carve and regularly that's uh, going to add on strips, like extrude them. And then if I hold control, it even changes to blue there and then it'll it'll carve the opposite way. And that's that goes for all of these tools. Uh, one more quick useful one here in the uh, upper like sculpting section is this plain one. And uh, you can see there's a plane right there, but it's at a really weird angle. So um, if I rotate around to an angle that I want and then I right click, it'll reset that uh, plane to the angle that I want. And I have right click, by the way, on my uh, pen, pen tablet as one of the options. So it, um, again, if I right click, it'll, it'll reset the plane to the angle that I'm on. And then if you sculpt on top of that with a bigger brush, it'll sort of add a plane there on the organic forms that we already sculpted. Okay, so I'll right click again. You can kind of see where it's intersecting and then you can, you can sculpt there. And that's uh, super useful if you just like did a very organic ugly block out like this and then you wanna um, you know, make something more angular and, and hard surface out of it. Okay, and uh, the, the, the size of, of the brush of course will affect how much you're you're cutting off with it. Okay, um, let's delete this. Oh, one quick thing about delete. In the, I had to set a hotkey for this. So in regular 3D code to delete an object, you actually have to click on the, the layer in the sculpt tree and then click this trash can button to delete it. Um, but I actually, uh, I actually set that to just the delete key because that's easier. Um, so I would definitely go ahead and do that. All you have to do is hover over the trash can hold end and then, you know, hit the delete key, just like we talked about for setting hotkeys. Um, it's not actually not letting me delete right now. And I think that's because we only have one layer in our, in our um, sculpt tree. So I think I actually have to add a new one and then it'll let me delete that old one. So I, I think you have like a minimum of one, <laughs> one layer for some reason. Um, okay, so let's add in, I'm gonna hit space bar, hit primitives, hit enter, place another cube. And uh, let's talk about a few other really useful um, tools in here. So probably the most useful that I wanna talk about, and you can definitely mess around with all of these, uh, but the most useful one would be cutoff probably. And um, um, one thing I have not mentioned is this, uh, the, the tool options for all of these. So the hotkey for that, I think it's by default is E. And that, well, that will bring up this, um, th this quick tool menu. And it looks like this for all of these tools, even th the ones that we just talked about. So yeah, I'm on grow right now. Even if I click build, see it gives me all these different options. And um, 
this this first one over here is it's kind of how what these icons are kind of how your brush is going to work within these tool these tools okay so if i'm on build and i hit e and i select this option then um our brush is going to sort of follow that that pattern where it's it uh fades in and then it fades out again okay so you can kind of see that if if we uh it's sort of like a pressure sensitivity thing, right? So you can kind of see that there where uh, it faded in, it got bigger and then it faded out, right? Versus if I hit E again and I select something like this right here that has a more constant pressure, you'll see, hopefully, okay, actually, it's not that noticeable, the difference. And that's because this brush already has a, uh, it has a little bit of a fade to it. So there's sort of two things affecting it. There's the, the tool option here, and then there's the brush itself. But uh, some, of, some of the other brushes, I think that'll be more apparent. So let's try, let's try a different one. Maybe this one, you can see that versus this fades out a little bit more and it is, is more affected by my brush sensitivity. Anyways, this is uh, something to mess around with. This one looks like it'll, it'll actually like skip and dot around, you can kind of see that you can mess around with all these. And then there's these really useful ones over here with, with just these shapes. So just as an example, I'll pick this rectangle. We just draw a rectangle, it'll sort of build using that rectangle. Same with the square. And then some of these other ones we'll talk about in a bit, but they're also very useful. So the reason I bring that up now is because with the cutoff tool, and I've set that hotkey to C, is, um, if you just am on, so if you hit E and then click the rectangle, then you can just click and drag anywhere and it'll cut off a huge section of your, of your mesh. So that's probably the fastest, most easy way to, to trim, trim the model that we're working on. Um, of course you can, so these other options are grayed out for cutoff and that's because they don't really apply, like it doesn't have a brush. So it's mainly about these shapes. So, you know, we can use the oval and it'll give us that. And uh, while I'm doing that, if I actually hold shift and then let go, it'll it'll do the interior of that shape as opposed to, uh, sorry, it'll it'll cut off the exterior as opposed to the interior. So that's that's shift, very very useful. Um, and then you can also just this one right here is probably very useful as well. It's just sort of like a lasso in Photoshop. So if that just sort of allows us to draw in any which way we want, and it'll it'll cut off what we, what we drew. So that's very, very quick. Uh, so let's cut off one more uh, really useful one is uh, all the way down here in this pose section and it's just the pose tool itself. And this is one of the most powerful and amazing tools in, in 3D code. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to orthographic mode really quick to show this. And uh, I'll probably snap to this view over here and I'm gonna hit E to, again to bring up this tool menu for pose. And we'll select this box one to make sure we're on box. And if I just click and drag out here and select this area of the mesh, it gives us this uh, gizmo. And what you'll kind of see right away is that if you click and drag these pieces, it's, um, it's posing the part that we selected with a really useful fall off. Okay, so this red is being affected the most and it sort of falls off down here and this bottom part is not being affected at all, right? Um, so this uh, tool menu over here has quite a few different options for the pose because there's, it's kind of complicated. Uh, the main one that I'm gonna try to, you know, make you aware of is this align to view one down here. Um, so if I click that, it aligns this gizmo with our current view and that's, probably what we're going to need the most because, you know, we went into this orthographic view for a reason. So just as an to show you that a bit more, I'll rotate over here, see the gizmo is, is not following us. So I have to click align to view again, and now um, it'll, we can use it more orthographic. Oh, and this, this piece here, we'll scale it, right? This, this will move it. So we'll even rotate it. And it's just, it's such a, and then you have to hit enter to, um, to you know, accept the the pose. So this is this is a very very useful tool in uh, in three D code, and uh, I, I think it's going to come up quite a bit in our next section. We'll we'll be using it a lot. Um, 
And you can also set a hotkey to these menus in here, by the way. And they, they kind of stack on top of other hotkeys. So it's like, if I were to set a hotkey to align to view, so you can hover over it and then hold end. And then I've set it to control A, okay? And now if I, uh, you know, if I hit pose, hit E, grab this, make a selection, then I hit control A, it'll, that, that's the hotkey I set it to. But that'll only affect that'll only be a useful hotkey when this tool options for pose is open, okay? So it's we've set control A to be aligned to view only when we're on the pose tool. Hopefully that makes sense. And it's, 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 it's sort of very intuitive when you start setting your own hotkeys and you'll see how that works. All right, so let's talk about a few more options. Um, for uh, using all the tools actually, uh, when you hit the E menu key. So there's all these many, many different options. And um, let's go to the cutoff tool. I have it set to just the letter C um, and show you what some of these other ones do. So obviously, uh, you know, these ones are pretty self-explanatory. You've got the square, the rectangle, you know, simple ones. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned this already, but if you click and drag, and you want to reposition the uh, selection, you just hold the space bar and uh, you can let go to, to uh, you know, accept the cut. Um, and I want to talk about this one over here, so, uh, or the difference between these two. So this one, um, you can kind of see what it does there. You click in different places and it'll make a straight cut. Uh, you can close the gap to accept the cut. Oops, I missed it. Uh, or you actually, you can just double click to anywhere to accept the cut as well, or to close the loop. Um, so that, that one's quite useful for just making, you know, like drawing your own straight cuts and everything. Um, but uh, this one as well with the curves is a little bit more complicated. You can hover over it to kind of get an explanation of it uh, as you can with many of the tools. There's great tool tips in uh, 3D code. But just to quickly show you if I select it um, and I click anywhere, it'll make a point and it'll work very similar to the pen tool in Illustrator and Photoshop, where if I make another point and then a third point, it'll actually create a curve. Um, it's kind of like averaging the, the curve between those, those distances. Um, and you can edit these points, you can keep selecting, and then you have to close the gap. Um, and then you actually, on this one, have to hit the Enter key to create the cut. Um, and I use this one all the time, um, but actually if you, if you hold Alt and rotate, it's still there. You can continue to you know, use it or move it around to, to uh, make more cuts. So if you wanna get rid of it, you just right click on it or near it and uh, click this delete item uh, menu option. And there you go. You can make uh, some nice curves with it. Okay, so a uh, couple more tools I wanna make sure that we cover um, that I use a lot are uh, Vox Hide and Split. And uh, they're kind of near the bottom of this list here. So we just keep scrolling down. Vox Hide is right here in this adjust section and uh, Split is all the way down here under objects. And uh, they're both sort of similar in their function. Um, I've set Vox Hide to V, so I'm just going to go ahead and hit that. And I'll explain when you would use Vox Hide and when you would use Split. Okay, so um, they're both sort of for making cut lines and um, very often you'll use them in um, more hard surface workflows, but uh, we're definitely gonna use them in our architecture stuff as well. So let's take a look. So I'm gonna switch into orthographic mode. And if I hit E, it'll bring up this menu once again, I'm just gonna select the rectangle. And you'll see very quickly that when I make a selection and let go, um, Vox hide will literally hide the section that I just selected. Um, but it's not deleted. It's actually just um, sitting there in, in the memory of 3D coat. And um, if we go up here to geometry menu, we see this very important uh, menu item here called objectify hidden volumes. And you can see I've set that to control one. There's another one here called delete hidden, which is I've set to control two. And both of those are gonna be very important. So when I click objectify hidden volumes, you'll see that the section that I just hid with Vox hide um, comes back in here, except now 
there's a uh, kind of a cut line where we made the selection and I also placed the new object, that's this one, in a new layer, okay? So it's very useful. Um, there's a little bit of a quirk with this though, and that is the um, hidden, the hidden section is still stored in 3D Code's memory. So if we don't go ahead and hit Control-2, or in the, if you want to see the menu item itself, it's this delete hidden, we're going to be, so you actually have to select the original object and then delete hidden. Um, otherwise, we're, we're going to accidentally keep re, recreating um, this placed object over and over, and it's going to get us a, like a really annoying um, doubled up geometry, which we don't want. So you kind of, every time you use this tool, you almost always want to, you know, use it, hit in the, you know, objectify hidden volumes, which I set to control one, and then probably you want to right away hit control two, um, except you actually have to select back to the original object and hit control two, because uh, each each layer has its own stored memory of, of hidden objects, if that makes sense. So this this original layer, um, if we if we box hide on there, 3D code remembers what's hidden on that layer. But then also if we select this other object and we do a box hide on that, 3D code also remembers what we just hit over here. Okay, so you have to select the object that uh, you want to clear the memory from. Okay, it's a little confusing, but you'll you'll get used to it, and uh, it's very very useful. There's also a bug with this tool, which I kind of want to mention. I hope they fixed it in uh, this 2021 version, but it is quite common. Uh, it was quite common, anyways, in the last version. So I'm not sure if they uh, if if they fixed it or not. And that is when you resample. Um, an object, sometimes it accidentally, um, it accidentally brings back the part that you just hid. So let's test it out right now. So we, we made a, a hide on this. Actually, let's, let's test it again. So we, we did, did a uh, box hide selection. We're not going to delete hidden, so it's still stored in that memory. I'll hit R and, and resample up. Okay, good. So it didn't happen. So hopefully they just fixed that in 2021. Um, if it, if it, if not, and it does happen to you, uh, you'll probably just have to save your scene and, and restart 3D code. That seemed to work before. Okay, so um, that's Voxhide, and uh, let's talk about Split for a second. Split is very similar, um, except it's a little bit sharper of a cut, um, and it also uh, uses the layers a little bit differently. So let's go ahead and select this object, and uh, we'll bring it over here so we can see what we're doing. And we will select the split tool over here. We'll do a rectangle. Um, and we will uh, go ahead and make a cut. And you'll see it actually doesn't look like anything happened. And that's because the cut uh, is so clean, basically. And then also, it added a new layer within the group of this first layer. So if I hide this, everything that's in that group is also hidden. And you can kind of see this layer here. That's the cut that we made is hidden there. Um, and uh, I don't know if I actually mentioned this before, but uh, the way groups work in the sculpt tree is you actually have to grab this uh, little six dots icon, and then you drag it onto the layer that you want to uh, group it with, and then you'll group them together like that. So uh, split does that automatically for you. So the new, the new uh, split object is automatically inside the group of the first object, whereas Voxhide makes a new, a new layer completely. Um, so yeah, so let's just separate this for a second and see what happened. So again, it was not only was it so clean that we couldn't even see it, but also this, it was such a clean cut that this uh, object doesn't really have a high enough resolution to show it. So split usually works a little bit better actually with a really high resolution object. Um, and uh, let's, let's do a quick test here and see if we can show that. So right now I'm selecting this first object Let's check the uh, resolution. It's only 280,000, which isn't really that high for 3D code. Let's up it all the way to like 1 million, I don't know, 200,000. Might take a second to load. You can see it, it just got higher res. So now this object is, is very, very high. And uh, now let's see what split does once we get past a million. Okay, so now it actually, you can almost see the cut now because it's high enough resolution to sort of uh, trace the, the, the cut. 
And uh, this bottom one is the new one. And let's move that down a bit. And you can see just how clean it cut. And it also, because we upped the resolution, the bevel itself of the cut is much cleaner. And that goes for Voxide too, actually, where uh, the, the bevel of the cut um, gets sharper the higher the resolution of the object. One more kind of hidden use of the split tool um, is the way it works um, in uh, adding the object that you're splitting to the group. So let me let me show you what I mean. And you'll kind of be surprised how often this comes up. So I'm going to hit my hotkey for the split tool. I have it set to Alt S. And I'll make a random cut here. And you'll see we, uh, we made a cut that you can't even see again because it's so sharp. So I'll just move this over here so you can kind of see it. Um, and we have, we have this top object and then something that's uh, parented to it, right? Um, and one, one use of split that uh, you kind of want a lot actually is to um, hit the hotkey and click the top object of the group. And we're going to select the whole thing. So all the voxels that are inside there. And now we have uh, everything that we just selected on that first group grouped to a empty. Okay, so now we have our two separate meshes grouped to an empty. Um, and an empty is just, uh, you know, what it sounds like. And, and a lot of other 3D programs work this way, where uh, if we go to the transform tool, we can move it around and everything that's in its group uh, is, um, you know, we can we can move it around because it's they're parented to it. So uh, yeah, you'll be surprised how often you want to use split for this function. Um, it, it kind of comes up a lot in, in hard surface workflows as well. Uh, and it is the best way, I think, to make an empty in 3D code. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. Down below these options here, there's this depth limit uh, checkbox. And uh, what that is, is it's sort of self-explanatory, but I'll just show you it in action. So if I, if I don't turn it on, then cutoff will cut uh, all the way through an object. I can double click to accept that uh, change, by the way. Um, and uh, yeah, there we see it sliced all the way through, no matter how big this cube is. If we check on depth limit, and um, we can adjust this number over here. Right now it's on 30. Um, that's kind of based on the global space uh, of, of this grid. So I'm actually going to lower it a little bit. Let's just do 7, 7.5 or so. Um, and let's let's see what happens when we make a cut there. It didn't go all the way through. It, it just went 7 units or, or 7 pixels or voxels. I'm not exactly sure how 3D code calculates this. So you kind of just have to eyeball it to see how far it goes. Um, so you know that's seven. If we're to up that to let's say 20, 22, make a cut, and went significantly deeper there. If we go all the way up to maybe 60-ish, it might might go a little deeper. Let's see what happens at 100. It almost went through our whole cube. So uh, you can use that in quite a variety of ways, and that works on. Um, that depth limit works on uh, vox hide quite well, it works with split quite well, even pose sometimes you might want to use that. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. So uh, one tool that you should be aware of that you'll use kind of a lot is the move tool. I've set that, it's uh, all the way down here uh, under the pose options and I've set the hotkey to the M, the letter M. And uh, basically you'll see this uh, little thing here. If you just click and drag, you'll be able to very, very quickly move your voxel mesh around as, just as if it were clay. Uh, and it's kind of the fastest way to um, just make small adjustments. And uh, of course you can right click and drag up to make it a really powerful move that'll kind of uh, extend a lot at a time or uh, you know a very small amount of power just to like make very small adjustments. Um, it is affected by the brushes over here as well. So um, you'll notice uh, kind of more pointy uh, movement with this one. And you can ch test out some of the others and, and get some different effects. Uh, and then lastly, it also works quite well with uh, symmetry. So if we turn on symmetry on the x-axis and uh, test it out, we'll see that uh, we will get something going very, very quickly. All right, one more tool that we really need to talk about um, that kind of gives you some really 
amazing shapes that you can't get with uh, some of those other ones is the curves tool. So it's kind of at the bottom of this menu. So if you keep scrolling all the way down, it is right here under the curves. And if you select it, uh, you'll get this green dot before you do anything. And it might actually be really, really small. So if you scale up and down with the middle mouse button scroll, uh, you, you can get it bigger before you do anything. And if you go ahead and click, it'll give you a red dot. If you click again, it'll make a connection. And then if you click again, it'll make a curve, just like the uh, pen tool in Photoshop and Illustrator. Um, and what this is, is a preview. So it hasn't placed anything yet. You'd have to hit enter to place the voxels, just like with the other primitives. Um, but before you do that, you can actually edit these points to give you um, some more uh, you know, interesting stuff. So if you right click and drag on any of these points, you can scale them up and also the area you know, around it. If you uh, middle mouse and click, you can drag these points around and move them in 3D space. And then if you uh, hold shift in between two points, it actually gives you this weird cone. And uh, what that is, is a rotation option. So it'll, um, it'll give you a direction of rotation based on which point you're closer to. So if I hover over here and do it, it'll rotate from there. If I hover over here, it'll rotate from there. Um, and then if I were to click again, it would just make a new connection point from the last point that we placed. Uh, but sometimes you don't want that. Sometimes you want to come from a different side. So what you would have to do is click and drag, left click and drag out of this area here, and then click uh, you know, to place a new point, and it would then come from there. And you can do that from multiple areas at once. So you can drag out from different areas, and then wherever you click to place a new point will just come from the last point that you placed. OK. Um, so there's a, another couple of points here um, in this menu here. There's a lot of really great options with this. Um, let's control Z back a bit just so that we don't have too much craziness going on. So in this profile option, if you, uh, it's a drop, nice little drop down here and um, straight is sort of the default, I think. But if you click on hemisphere, it'll give you like a rounded cap to the ends of these. Oops, we don't want that. Um, there's some really great ones as well, like uh, spike self-explanatory right it's like sharper uh worm i think goes in and out a bit it's like a different uh brush stroke almost some of the muscle intended ones are really useful as well where they kind of i think they kind of like get bigger near points themselves so you can mess around with these profiles and see which one works for the best for what you're doing um this filled inside option is really useful as well that you know literally just gives you a uh i don't know what that is kind of looks like a wing or something uh, but you can still edit the points. So that's very useful for some shapes. And then uh, this add scale option right here, if you click and drag, you can edit that and it'll give you kind of a thinner shape, which is very useful. And that also, not the profile scale. I think profile scale is the, the scale of these caps and add scale is just the overall scale. And that works as well for, for just the tube, right? So if we uncheck filled inside and then do this, it'll, it'll give us some different sizes. So I really like this tool. There's a lot you can do with it. You can definitely mess around with it more. Very often you'll use this tool with, uh, with symmetry. So you know if we were to turn on symmetry and put it on the x-axis, we would instantly see that before we even place anything, all of this is working in tandem with symmetry, just like we, we went over. Uh, and now if I hit enter, it'll place that as a voxel mesh. Might take a second because this is quite large. Okay, we might crash it. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'm going to go over uh, a little bit of the basics of shaders in 3D Coat. And um, I'm not too familiar with them, actually. I, I tend to do all my texturing and, and shading in uh, Blender, and that's what we're going to do for this process. But I just wanted to mention it because sometimes it is helpful for uh, breaking up different groups and pieces. So right now we've uh, selected this color palette menu right here. If we just click this shaders tab, it'll bring up some default options. And uh, within here, there there are additional sub menus. So that here's the default ones, and then there's uh, you know cartoon, fabric, metal. Um, some other weird miscellaneous ones. And uh, most of the time I just stay on the default tab. And what happens is if we just go ahead and click one of these, let's select this one, um, this menu popped up 
and it says the shader you have chosen has cavity and bulge settings. Cavity may look too intensely. Basically, I'm just going to click OK. It's it's just telling us that this particular shader um, has um, it has settings that look different based on how how far in and how far out uh, the mesh is is protruding. So apologies for this weird sculpture here, by the way. I, that's just one of the uh, default options when you uh, open up voxels. OK, so um, yeah, so right away we get this pretty interesting golden uh, textured metal. And that's just, again, just completely default. And uh, if you right click on the shader itself, you get a whole bunch of interesting options. Um, edit it, permanent shading, shader settings is the one that I'm going to talk about. And that's just um, editing the ones that are here in this default menu. And that uh, will bring up this very useful menu. Most of this is very self-explanatory, but just to go over it very quickly, um, modulate gloss by texture, that, that kind of has to do with um, the, right, the shininess, the glossiness uh, based on the texture itself. Um, there's these texture maps here. So this you can actually load your own texture if you wanted to make your own slightly different shader. Um, so if you selected this, you could, um, you could browse your computer and select a different one. Uh, gloss texture, you probably want to use the same image that you use for the color texture. Um, metalness texture, you, again, you probably just want to use the same, the same type and it'll, it'll pull different information uh, based on the, the darks and lights, similar to a lot of 3D programs. Um, there, you can also click on these um, colors and, and adjust them. So cavity color will be the color, again, where uh, the, the mesh sort of has a little divot or a cavity. So just to show that here. If I make this a little bit bluer, you can kind of see it there. It's, if I make it even, oh, it's, it's just in the ear actually, because I'm selected on the ear. Um, so yeah, you see that, that's, that's the uh, color inside there. Probably wouldn't want that for this gold material, but just for, uh, just to show you. So bulge color would be the opposite of that. So that would be the, the color on this very, you know, the, the areas that protrude. If we change that, let's say to like a pink, you know, you can adjust that color here. Um, bulge metalness, that's kind of like the shininess of it. I, I would definitely suggest play with all of these. Bumpiness, that's kind of like the, the textural bumpiness there. I think that's just like basically the normal map um, if you're familiar with uh, 3D programs. So um, yeah, I would suggest just playing around with all of this. Um, if you hit OK though, it will change that, um, that original material uh, permanently, right? So that was this edit it permanent shader settings option. Um, and let's say we were we were happy with that change. We could go ahead and select the other ones, click this, and it would change it to uh, to that new material. Um, so yeah, I would definitely uh, mess around with all of these. What I generally use this for in 3D coat is um, exactly this, where if I want like different different sections uh, to have different colors, um, and then later I'll completely retexture anyway in Blender, but um, just for for keeping things um, from my own design sense organized, it is, it is nice to be able to change things quite quickly here. Um, the other thing I haven't mentioned, let's let's change all this to a, a more normal color really quick because it's pretty crazy. Okay, so the other thing I haven't mentioned is right now we're in the sculptor room. And um, if, you, if you wanted to kind of see things a little bit differently, a little bit more realistically, you would click this uh, sculpt menu option up here and we would switch to a different room. So we're not gonna cover too much of all this, but the main one that we're gonna talk about right now is this render option. And basically that is, um, it's showing our mesh with a somewhat real-time lighting. And you can adjust that lighting with some of these menu options up here. So I believe it's this one. That's the texture of the environment map that uh, 3D Coat is using to to color and light this um, this object. So you know, if we were to click this one with a lot of blues and yellows, we would kind of see that you know pop up over here. Um, so again, that's this button here. It's like the HDRIs basically. This one will have a bit more greens, and um, you can actually uh, render straight from 3D Coat, and it will it will give you a render based on the lighting setup here. Um, I don't recommend doing that. Uh, too much and it's almost always better to render in a different program because I mean you can like add lights and and other um, 
render options in here, but it's very um, it's very difficult to use. There aren't actually physical lights that you can move around uh, like there are in Blender. This is more just sort of um, you kind of just have to eyeball it and see what looks good. Uh, but basically, I use the render room just to kind of like see some more details and and like adjust the lighting just to get a sense of what it would look like when I do texture everything in Blender. Um, so let's let's switch back over to the sculpt room. And I um, uh, just wanted to, last thing I wanted to mention here is uh, you can also click this plus button to create a new shader instead of editing one that, that's already here. Um, so let's just name that test tutorial. We'll click OK. And then uh, you, can, you can also create a, the same, um, you can also create a, a material from scratch using the same type of setting. So uh, you'll notice this menu is a lot smaller than the other one was. And that's because we haven't checked on all this stuff. So if we were, let's say, to check on everything here, then we get all those texture options and, and uh, that'll give us a lot more to play with. <laughs>